How has your or your child's face grown? And how does this affect you? Most people assume that the way your face grows is genetic. That image on your passport, the face that looks back to you from any mirror, it's you. And we're very resistant to feeling that this isn't set, that it changes, and that things in your environment can affect it, or that your face hasn't grown perfectly as it should. Now, we know you can gain significant changes in physical form. Here's an image from Weight Watchers, but I've seen physical changes that far exceed this with bodybuilders, particularly people who are having a big change over their growth phase. The question, obviously, is can you change facial form in the same way? And of course, we know you can. Look at anyone who's had a stroke and there will be a predictable and quite large change in facial form. One side seems to melt down when the muscles change their action. The problem is not that we can change physical form, it's just difficult to do it correctly. In some ways, we have become creatures of habit. Now, I'm an orthodontist, so I come to this area from an orthodontic perspective, and in principle, why are teeth crooked? It was the big gap in my training. And to be honest, the orthodontic profession openly admits that they don't know why teeth are crooked. They can attribute a cause in about 5% of the population. And those are usually the syndromes, the traumas, the really obvious ones. It's not the average person. For your average person that goes to an orthodontist, they don't know what causes the problem. Now, the hard scientific evidence. Well, interestingly, the quality papers in respected peer-reviewed journals seem to all strongly suggest that this is a disease of the environment. It's acquired disease. None of our ancestors had crooked teeth. None of the other 5,400 species of mammals have crooked teeth, except possibly a few domesticated cats and dogs, which is what we would expect. And it's only through understanding the cause of a problem that we're ever going to be able to properly treat it, because medicine is about treating the causes of the problem. Now, one of the groups I've always found interesting is the Inuit population in Canada. At a stroke of a pen, the Canadian Inuits were made Canadian citizens, and many of the groups emigrated en masse into social housing and receiving welfare payments, accepting a modern diet. And here is a group that are genetically similar. They have not changed, and yet within two, possibly even one generation, they've gained the same level of crooked teeth that you see in the general Canadian population. And there's no difference genetically. You assume the same environment, and the same thing seems to occur. When you talk to archaeologists or anthropologists, you'll find that these professions see crooked teeth as a sign of civilization. However, the orthodontic profession is treating malocclusion as if it was almost entirely genetic. We use appliances like this, fixed appliances, to artificially make the teeth straight, frequently with extractions and sometimes even surgery. And when we mean extractions, we're not talking about wisdom teeth. It's almost accepted that wisdom teeth are some form of genetic aberration that, like an appendix, we've grown out of the need, so they're going. There's actually no scientific evidence for this. 
and many people lose not only a tooth for orthodontic therapy, but don't have their wisdom teeth as well. So that's down eight teeth. Now, that amazes me. All my fingers fit on my hands. My legs are the same length. There must be something very wrong if people are missing space for eight teeth in their mouth, or if they need a surgical correction, where only a few thousand years ago, no surgical corrections were necessary. It also concerns me that at the end of therapy, people are required to wear retainers indefinitely, forever, the rest of their life. Surely something must be very wrong with the treatment if it's unable to maintain a permanent correction. And the whole concept of holding teeth out of their balance zone permanently really worries me. Worries me that that will affect the actual life of the teeth. So what has gone wrong? Well, the three main areas which we feel have changed significantly would be the diet. We've gone from predominantly a hard, tough, rough diet. People needed to consume a huge amount of food. They were working out more. They were using more energy. More energy. And we've moved to a very soft, very calorie-rich food, just at the moment as we use less energy. It's clear from the wear on teeth that we're now exerting considerably less masticatory effort. You know, use these or you will lose. It's a case of use it or lose it. If you have strong muscles, you tend to have a square face. Also, there's been a dramatic change in oral posture. The, num the frequency of nasal obstructions has gone up exponentially. And if you have a blocked nose, you are forced to either drop your tongue, separate your lips and open your mouth or, well, not breathe. And it seems that what starts as a necessity becomes a habit. And this combination of weakening muscles and an open mouth posture seems to be lengthening the face, causing a downswing in facial form. It also seems that the reduced time of breastfeeding and the early introduction of sort of soft pureed foods is disrupting the normal development of a swallow. And that is more influential on the position of the teeth. This illustration is quite useful. If the tongue is on the roof of the mouth at rest, and there's a strong biting force between the teeth, then the face tends to grow forwards, under tight control. And yet, if the tongue is hanging low in the mouth, where you're resting with your mouth open, and you have weak muscle tone, then the face tends to lengthen, dropping down. And certain adjustments are then made to protect the airway. The facial form seems to have dropped down and back, it seems to have downswung. Here we have an image of an ancient man set against an image of a good grower. And you see how the whole facial form seems to have dropped down and back. And of course, this is carrying the tongue down back towards the airway. This is what we refer to as a downswing in facial form. If you see this young girl, she is a good example of how, as she has grown, her face has downswung. As this has occurred, her face has lengthened. And since she only has so much face, it has also got narrower and it's got shallower. So within the cross-section area, there is less space for the tongue, her teeth and the airway. So she'll have crooked teeth, but also she's got a restricted airway. 
And there's certain compensations that we can make to correct this. The first compensation is moving the head and neck, usually extending the head to open the airway. And the second is changes in the position of the tongue and the jaw. So we've termed this downswing in facial form as craniofacial dystrophy. This is the first time someone's tried to put a name to the pathological process underlying crooked teeth. Now, it seems that a face that's the not the right shape isn't going to work as effectively as if it had the correct architecture. And there's a number of different problems that seem to be occurring as a result of this change in facial form. Things like blocked noses. If your face is narrower, you're more likely to have a blocked nose. Sleep apnea and snoring. Probably the biggest symptom is not crooked teeth. It's the effect on the airway. And how, as the face downswings, as it melts down and back, the tongue is being carried closer and closer to the airway, closer and closer to the hyoid bone. It seems that one of the most statistically significant measurements is the insertion of the tongue and the back of the pharyngeal wall. And as this reduces, the chance of sleep apnea increases. So the more downswung you are, the more you're likely to have sleep apnea. And this is very well demonstrated in multiple studies. And of course, if you're snoring today, you're likely to have sleep apnea tomorrow. And the raising concern is the effect of sleep apnea on the IQ and social development of children. And of course, also on life expectancy. Now, why have you never heard of this before? Well, my father has spent a lifetime trying to raise awareness. I think his mistake has been he's tried to promote the treatment method he was using. I've spent over a decade trying to engage my profession on debate on why teeth are crooked. I thought this would be the, the crux point. And fortunately, despite an enormous effort, no one within my profession at all seems interested. And of course, there is always going to be a resistance to change. And there is a poor cost benefit from treating as we do. A phrase I often use is that who makes money, a dietitian or a liposurgeon? Fixing things makes money. Preventing things doesn't make money. And we are providing a competitive idea. It's not something you can add to orthodontics. We're saying that orthodontics and a lot of other specialities of the face are going in the wrong direction. And people really don't want to hear that. The medical profession is very happy to listen to ideas that further the consensus. It is not happy to listen to ideas that are in conflict with the consensus. Now, we have tried to engage with endlessly with people on research. Um, we have an outstanding challenge for anyone who wants to undertake case comparisons. But research doesn't occur without assistance from significant universities and research institutions. It's very easy to turn around and say, prove your case. It is only lucky that Einstein and these other great thinkers were not asked to prove their cases. It is very difficult to prove anything. And without the assistance from a research foundation or institution, research is, is not going to happen. It's the easiest way to shut people up is ask them to show me the evidence because it's a very difficult thing to do. Now, clearly the treatment we provide bioblock orthotropics can significantly affect the development of the face. And I'm working towards the point where changes like this are my normal. But what next? This channel is about raising awareness of the fact the facial form is under significant environmental influence. 
People need to know this. You can affect your own facial form within your lifetime, particularly if you're young, but right up till 25, it's relatively easy to do this. And at any point in life, it is possible, but clearly it becomes more and more difficult. However, I believe we can prevent all of these problems. I believe we could prevent craniofacial dystrophy. I believe that we could gain an upswing in facial form in all people with simple public health messages, simple exercises, simple protocols that are not expensive, that are simple and could prevent most of these problems, saving a huge amount to health care systems. And we are now engaged with a group in making a petition to government to force debate on these subjects. And if you really want these, this science, this area to help you, you need to help us gain the spotlight of modern medical research focused on this area. At the moment, we're a competitive idea to many other ideas, and there is complete exclusion. There is little or no research in these areas. And to get the spotlight of modern research focused on this, to implement change on a policy level to encourage prevention, we need your help and your help for a petition to government to get that change. Many of you watching this channel over the last few years must have wondered where I was going, what I wanted to achieve. Well, the last 10 years of my life has been focused on leading to this moment when we can start engaging change on a governmental level to set in stone a sequence of events to benefit the public, to benefit all people so that we can understand these things and we can try and prevent, because this has to be prevention. And for those too old for prevention, we have to work out the best way to gain the best change in people with the least harm and for the most cost effective. Thank you very much.